What is up, Earthnoids, Spacenoids, and new types alike? It has been a while since I've made a video, I apologize, but I am back and ready to tell you all of the history of Universal Century. In our last video, we discussed the advent of Char's rise to power, or as you like to remind me in the comments, Char! He helped inspire Garma Zabi to take command of his fellow 200 cadets from the recently created Autonomous Republic of Xeon Military Academy at Guardian Bianchi at Side 3, an ambush, Fetty installations, looking to seize control of their operation. This came to be known as the Dawn Rebellion and debatably the start of the One Year War. Zoom City praised the cadets and they were treated as heroes. However, due to Dozel's negligence, he was forced to resign as the superintendent of Xeon's military academy. Don't be too sad for him, however. With the power of nepotism, we shall see in this video that not only does this lead to him being the vice admiral of a fleet, the Don Rebellion also created a circumstance in which he met his future wife. Nothing says love like distracting your commander at gunpoint. If the Don Rebellion was the linchpin to kicking off the One Year War, the Battle of Loam solidified its fate and is the start of Mobile Suit Gundam's biggest running theme, War is Bad on All Sides. Thanks to the Minofsky Particle, the Mobile Suits were no longer bound to utility, such as construction. It could now be used for various purposes, including military conflict. Here we will see Shine as a mobile suit pilot and we will see how he earns the nickname the Red Comet. So let's get into this devastating battle. We will go over the fallout of Operation British and follow a step-by-step -step playbook of the events of this battle that occurred in the middle of January in UC0079. If you are looking to dive into a series that showcases the battle alone, be sure to watch Mobile Suit Gundam Origin and Mobile Suit Gundam Igloo, as of course Mobile Suit Gundam The Origin Manga. So let's get into this. In the history of mankind, there has never been a decisive battle in space, let alone a fleet battle. Soldiers make history. These words were uttered in Mobile Suit Gundam Igloo, and no words were ever wiser considering the outcome of the Battle of Loam. Now one thing I would like to point out are some inconsistencies in time. If you watch Igloo, as well as follow along with some of the original Gundam canon, it seems that the actual battle took place on the 15th of January and lasted about two and a half days. However, Gundam Origins mentions this battle takes place on January 23rd. So take the dates with the grain of salt. However, I'm going to mention that this battle takes place on the 15th. What we do know about this conflict is that it occurred in mid-January of Universal Century 79, and that the battle lasted about three days, and the build-up and the aftermath lasted about ten days. After the failed attempt at destroying Jaburu during Operation British, it was clear that Xeon would attempt another colony drop. Mada, mada. Mada, mada. Hold on, I know what you are saying. Are you glossing over a colony drop? The most interesting, destructive, and most importantly, memeable events surrounding the lore of Gundam. Yes, yes I am. We will return to this point in another video, but for now, bear with me. Operation British is vitally important to the landscape of Earth and played a huge role. But I wanted to emphasize the Battle of Loam first simply because it was the first fleet battle in UC history. And because it was the one battle where Earth Federation didn't take into account one thing, the creation of the mobile suit. So imagine you are a fleet admiral with decades of naval strategy. Then all of a sudden you are met with a balloon carrier that drops incendiary bombs from above. You've seen nothing like this. Balloon carriers were considered the first aircraft carriers. These short-range, highly versatile, highly maneuverable planes that require less fuel to carry were a game-changer in military strategy. What we are seeing is the same situation playing out in space for the first time. The Federation might have understood how a Guazian class Xeon ship operates, but 
It doesn't seem like they were prepared for the Xeon forces using what is usually a transport ship to carry mobile suits into the battlefield. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to be butchering and bastardizing these names very much, so I look forward to you guys commenting on It is along with the use of the Minoski particle to hinder Federation forces' scouting abilities, which make this one of the more fascinating gunman battles from a perspective of military strategy. So after this one-week conflict that ended with a failed attempt at destroying Jaburo, Xeon had their sights on side fight, also known as Lone. Now remember, each side has its own name, as well as their corresponding number. The Federation got wind of this potential attack, but some speculate that Xeon leaked this info to the Fetis. Now let's take a look at the players on the battlefield. On the Xeon side, you have Dozel Zabi, who is commanding the First Fleet. Dagon and Garmazavi are observing from afar on their flagship. Lieutenant Sir is the mobile suit pilot for the 6th Fleet, along with Char is the Black Tristars, consisting of Gaia, Ortega, and Mash, created by Kaecilia for her own mischievous purposes. On the Federation side, you have Lieutenant General Revel, who possessed considerable commanding capabilities in space, air, ground, and sea. Alongside Revel is his second-in-command, Brigadier General Kennedy, or Cunningham, who would sacrifice himself during this battle. On top of the players, we need our pieces on the chessboard. In this battle on the Federation side, now remember, I'm going to mess up a lot of these names. We have 48 Magellan-class ships, 63 Salamis-class ships, 118 L-144 minesweepers who played mostly upon, and 84 Columbus-class ships, mainly used to scatter Minovsky particles on the battlefield. On the Zeke side, there are four Guazin-class ships, 78 Chevet and Musai-class ships, 34 Jiko assault boats, 22 Papua-class ships, and the number one thing that were used to give the Xeon forces this victory, mobile suits. Now, if you notice the vast difference between numbers in Xeon and Nerf Federation forces, Xeon is vastly outnumbered in fleet ships. However, Xeon forces have 320 Zaku 1s and 2,600 Zaku 2s on the battlefield. Remember, Xeon's mobile suit fleet were faster and more versatile on the battlefield. Having a few mobile suits targeting the bridge of a Magellan class ship was now simpler and didn't need the sheer power of the fleet. Get in, get out. But in order for mobile suits to dominate on the battlefield, the Xeon fleet would need a strategy that would give them the upper hand. They need to surprise the Fetis. On the 13th of January, Dozel Zabi has command of the first Xeon combined fleet. See, everything worked out for him. He groups up with Solomon, which is like an asteroid, which at this time is under construction. Along with this fleet is the QCX-76A Jormungand, a prototype Minovsky-powered beam cannon. Meanwhile, the Federation forces were gathering at Luna 2. Lieutenant General Revel ordered all available ships to join him. So let's look at the board. Solomon is located here, in between the L5 and L2 point. This is where the Xeon fleet is located. Over here, at Luna 2, is where the Earth forces are gathering. The Fetty trajectory is simple. Head straight to side 5. Zeke trajectory is to loop around the dark side of the moon and make a stop at Granada, the moon's second largest city. It is here that Dozel linked up with more of the fleet and created a true Xeonic front. On January 15th, Dozel and the fleet made it to side 5. Knowing that they were on their way, the Federation forces would be a little late to the game. Although looping around the moon while going radio black helped, what was the biggest player in this battle was the pulse engine. These pulse engines contain Minovsky particles, which by effect make typical radar used during this time relatively useless. Xeon forces placed these pulse engines onto the 11th colony of Side 5, as well as placed them 
on the rear and front of their fleets. Once the Federation forces finally made their way to Side 5, Revel noticed that radars were jammed and utterly useless. They were going in completely blind. Revel sends out the announcement to the world, I expect a good fight from you all. And this was the signal of the beginning of the battle. The battle has begun. The Fetties had to rely on their eyes for most of the battle, as their radars were useless. But for Revel, this probably didn't seem like a problem, as their fleet was superior in numbers. Once the six mobile fleet were on their way, the Xeon First Fleet split up, keeping a strong front while moving to assist the mobile fleet. This was a tough game of cat and mouse for the Federation, as they were relying mostly on visual confirmation. Now this is where Joe Maiden comes in, I think I'm pronouncing that right? And although it could play a bigger role in this battle, it didn't happen. My guess is that mobile suit technology was the clear winner of this conflict. It revolutionized the war at this time. Much like the mobile suit, J Jormungan, Jormungan, that's a mouthful, man. Jormungan was an experimental project that just never took off after mobile suits came to market. Sure, it showed up a few years later, a couple times, but it was clear that there was a better use of the Manofsky particle technology. In Igloo, we see Char coming in to finally help out the diverted fleet. He sends a message stating that they could hold back while the mobile fleet takes command. However, in Origin, Char goes in guns blazing at three times normal speed. Three times normal speed? Three times normal speed! Three times normal speed! Mobile suits come in picking off Magellan class ships. Without the help of their radar, they assume that these are smaller fleet ships on Xeon. But it isn't till they get visual confirmation that it is a mobile suit. This is something that the Federation truly wasn't prepared for. Single-handedly destroyed five Magellan and Salamis class ships. Once the mobile fleet came in, there was nothing left for the Fetties to do but to retreat. But for most, it was too late. General Revel's ship was destroyed. However, he was able to escape via an escape pod. The Black Tristars considered killing the escape pod, but notices the Admiralty is on board. They use this opportunity to capture Lieutenant General Revel as a POW. Because of this, Cunningham, or Cunningham, uses this opportunity, thinking that Revel is KIA, to take his fleet, the TMN fleet, and shield the remaining Federation ships fleeing. In Origin, he also had the opportunity to attack Degwin Zabi's Guazin class flagship, but chose not to. The teaming fleet was soon eviscerated on the battlefield, but allowed little of what's left of the Federation to escape. The first combined fleet of Xenon decided to cease operation and return to Solomon in Side 3. The Federation forces lost 36 Magellan-class ships, 139 Salamis-class ships, and all but two Minesweepers and two Columbus-class ships survived. Around 80% of all Federation forces were destroyed during this battle. On the Zeke side, two Guazin class ships were damaged, 22 Chevet class ships were heavily damaged or destroyed, and four Papua class ships were slightly damaged as they were in the rear. I have no data on how many Zakus were damaged or destroyed, so if you know, throw that knowledge my way. They couldn't have all made it out, right? Oh yes, and not to mention, that all of Side 5 was destroyed, including its 2 billion inhabitants. Gone in a day. I think the importance here is time. Between Operation British and the Battle of Loam, roughly a week has passed. 2 billion lost in space after 16% of Australia became uninhabitable. We could say that devastating losses were seen everywhere. The Battle of Loam would not only be the first fleet battle to ever occur, but it would also be the last. With the creation of the Monoski Particle, traditional techniques of using radar were no longer an option. 
now start seeing an innovation in Minovsky technology, not only in the creation of the Gundam, but you will also see your prototypical fleets armed to handle a post-radar world. Xeon made a propaganda broadcast on January 17th to all Earth, showcasing their battle results, new weapons, and captured Revel, boosting Xeon morale while further lowering Federation morale. This certainly was a gut punch to the Federation forces and further weakened by the later peace treaty signing between Xeon and the neutral colony Side 6. Would it lead to the Earth Federation signing a peace treaty with the Xeon forces? Well, we shall find out next time. That'll do it for this video. In the future, we shall see what happens with the capture of Revel, and of course, we will talk about that colony drop you are all lusting over. Sense it. I am a new type after all. I want to thank the website, the Anaheim Journal. They had a really cool write-up on the Battle of Loam, and I used them as a reference point throughout this video. And this is on a new channel. I apologize. I got locked out of my old Google account, but luckily, I wasn't too many videos in. So please subscribe to this channel. Thanks.